Hello and welcome to whatever this channel actually is now. Um, are we blacksmithing, gaming, brewing? Have we made a video in two years? Control panels are a thing that you might need. Um, and that's what we want to talk about in this video. So um, what I want to do is um, talk about some of the design considerations for uh, control panels that you might use in brewing or distilling applications. Um, the one I have here is half finished. Uh, well, not quite half. But we'll be working on this one as we go. So, um, this is a very simple, quite small panel that will be used for controlling the bigger of a boil. So we will be looking, uh, we will be uh, controlling the power going to an electric heating element. Um, in this case it's a five and a half kilowatt um, electric heating element, so that's the reason why we've gone for something this bulky. Now, what <coughs> This, this isn't designed to be a how-to guide. If you're looking for more detailed information, I strongly recommend you uh, visit theelectricbrewery.com. Um, it's an open source uh, guide for creating electric breweries, and it's very thorough, and it's what I've used in uh, a lot of my stuff. Now, I don't want to make this a guide because I'm not an electrician. Um, I have, however, put together several control panels for brewing, home brewing, and just want to share this latest one and some of the design considerations and process that's involved in that and you know maybe uh, maybe there'll be some useful insights in there for you. So let's talk about the finished article and we can take it from there. So this is it, it's a panel that controls stuff, we have what more do you want? Um, it's got a switch on and off. You might be wondering why it's a key switch rather than a regular switch. It has a voltmeter, a manual um, analog voltmeter. You might be wondering why that's on there. It has a light. Um, this is always good to know when you've got it switched on or off. Um, this is a potentiometer. So this d does the control um, so I'll talk you through how this works exactly, but all we need to know here, as it affects your design, this is just something that controls the power. And underneath we've got a um, power meter. Now I would turn this on and show you, but um, unfortunately I can't quite get it to work. So. Uh, you'll just have to take my word for it. I'll probably put a picture up here somewhere. It will show you the voltage, the current, uh, and the power being used at any given time. And I think it, it keeps track of the total number of um, kilowatt hours used, and you can reset it with the button here. It's really useful if you're running, um, if you're wanting consistent results, to be able to see exactly how many watts you're putting in. Because, you know, the exact, you know, that you know, a tiny few degrees difference can make a big difference in wattage. So something like this is really good for repeatability. The other way would be to have an ammeter of some sort. But th this is this is a nice solution, I find. So where we've mounted all of these, we've mounted them. If they most of these are IP rated, and have um, grommets around here, which. Uh, prevent water ingress. Uh, some of them don't have an IP rating, so these have been sealed as they've gone in with silicone. They're tight fits anyway, but a bit of silicone around all of these things uh, keeps it nice and dry. Speaking of ingress protection though, if you're being, you know, what we're doing is hobbyist, so it's not quite as important, um, things like this panel meter Probably, if it got wet enough, it would actually leak through the the unit itself. Th these are protected fully. They're designed for it. You can spray as much water at these. There's no way for the water to get from the outside to the inside, or indeed to actually damage the, the unit itself. 
if you this I think is okay this if you sprayed water at it it would a break with enough water and b actually properly let water inside so just consider that um, what we're trying to do being hobbyists is make something that works for us IP protection is great because um, you know you don't you don't want your stuff getting wet but it's not going to be as bulletproof as a professionally done panel with properly properly sourced and properly rated goods but we can follow best practice down here we have the the inlet so this I'll talk about again the, the specifics of the electricals in a minute but this is a, a cable gland so this is this is you drill the hole you put the gland in it's got a um, sort of a gasket and it's this this clamps down on the flex cable so it's it's offering some mechanical uh, sort of resistance to make sure you're not going to yank the cables out and it's waterproofing the connection uh, and finally the outlet is a um, 16 amp commando plug which again mounts there's a there's a rubber grommet that goes all around the inside which protects it from water uh, it has a flat the, these are rated so uh, this is quite a simple in terms of inputs and outputs these are very simple boxes not too much going on here there's not too much input output and half the stuff on here is frankly a little bit you know unnecessary so let's uh, let's crack it open and, and talk about the electricals um, it's important to remember when when you get all the parts remember to keep the, the tool the the little key for opening this um, it's really handy to have so what the hell's going on in here let's go through it let's see if we can shed some light on the situation hmm. okay that'll do so again this isn't, um, there's not an outrageous amount going on here, but it does look a bit daunting. So, ah, <laughs> nearly forgot, heat sink. Um, this was made using an aluminium plate and uh, <laughs> I made a heat sink using just, you know, just some spare aluminium and a heat sink. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the specifics of this and how this was put together after I've explained what's going on here. So what we got, we have got power coming in. Power comes in through this. Now, excuse the, <laughs> I haven't hoovered after stripping all these cables. So this, uh, this, this cable and this plug. So what this will be hooking up to is a commando socket, much like this mounted on the wall which is hooked up to a 32 amp breaker so therefore everything up until there's something to derate it has to be rated to 32 amps general rule of thumb so plug obviously it's a 32 amp plug it plug it doesn't fit if it's not um, the cable is four mil square cable which can carry um, safely 32 amps and some change. It's coming in and we have a live neutral on earth. Um, we, if you're not familiar, UK, brown and Europe, I, I believe all of Europe, brown is live, blue is neutral and yellow and green is earth. In the UK we have 240 volts. So we, we have the light, first of all, most importantly, the earth, okay? This has to be earthed. This unit must be earthed, very important. And that's done using um, a ring terminal bolted on there to a main, that, so anything earthed all goes through there. So that earths the whole unit and anything connected to it. Again, very, very important. When you plan your layout, when you, when you, when you cut the cable for this, what you want 
is for if if you yanked this and assuming there was some sort of failure and you yanked this and this all pulled out, you want ideally the live to come out first, the neutral to come out second, and the earth to come out last. It's important because if you've got shorts going, you know, flying around, that um, the box remains earth. It's incredibly critical. So you're assuming a load of failures, but it's, it's just good practice. So make, in this case, these are all cut the same length because the, the earth is down here, so it would be the last thing to pull out. So, right. So we talked the cable coming in. What's next? So the load we're, we're, we're going to be putting on this will be no more than 20 amps because it's a 5500 watt element. This solid state relay, which we will talk about, is rated to 25 amps. It can't handle more than that. So it makes sense then to step down to protect this and prevent other failures to step down the rating. So what's what's happening, the very first thing that happens here is the, the, the live comes in into the bottom of this circuit breaker. Now this is just an MCB, it only switches based on current. Um, so anything after this, we can now treat as a 25 amp load rather than a 32 amp potential load. So therefore we can use the 25, um, 25 amp solid state relay, no problem. And if we wanted, we can step down the cable size. So overview, cable comes in. Um, we have a breaker, 25 amp breaker. From here, we go via a contactor. A contactor, I prefer to relays and I prefer to um, solid state relays. It's it, but it performs the same function. So a it's just an electro electromagnetic magnetic switch. So we can use a low low current circuit to switch a high current circuit. So you've got the the output of this this breaker is going via the contactor, so a switch basically, to the relay, and from the relay to the socket. At the same time, we have another output from this 25 amp relay, a 25 amp breaker, sorry, coming to this six amp breaker. Now the six amp breaker is going up and doing the control circuit. So it's a lower, lower rated and we, we step down the rating um, to protect the switches. If there was some sort of failure, it, it would mean that it would break sooner, the, 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 the breaker would switch off sooner. It doesn't need 25 amps to break it, it needs 6 amps to break it. And the current going through here will be very, very, very low. It won't approach 6 amps at all. Now, this will be RCD protected, or ground GFCI, I think, in the US. So it will be protected via that means as well. But it's always good practice, and it means that, again, we can use lower rated cable. For the control circuit. So from the six amp, um, uh, the six amp uh, breaker, we have kind of a, a live bus. So it's coming through here and connecting together. Common it well, it comes to the switch, the the key switch, and then the output of that. So when when it's switched on it commons together one terminal on the voltmeter, the pilot lights, and the uh, power meter, as well as the um, live terminal on the contactor here. So basically, when you switch that on, all of a sudden, boom, all this stuff is powered and as is the contactor. The neutral is again just common together. So we're coming in together all of these components 
and the contactor. Now, one thing with the with, with the contactor that I like is that, well, you can get relays to do the same thing, but one of the nice things is that it is double double pole. So that means that you're not just switching the live, you're also switching the neutral. So it's a, it shouldn't be a problem. It's just an extra added safety thing. So the neutral coming in of this a neutral line is going straight to one of the pins of the contactor, um, where we also take the line off to go all around here. So the yeah the the neutral neutral is switched past this point. So what you have is that when you when you switch this on is to say all this goes live, and out of the bottom of this you now have the high current circuit, uh, which connects the neutral connects straight to the socket, and the live goes up to this solid state relay. Now this solid state relay it's it's basically a thyristor. It's a phase angle controller, and these come in lots of different formats. I like it in this kind of, I'm not even sure if solid state relay is the right terminology here. Um, but I like the, the package it comes in. It's very mountable, very accessible. It's just easy to use. So I quite like these. So what ha what's going on with this is we have two lives basically. We, we Over here we have the two, we have what's coming out of the contactor and we have the output, which then goes straight to the socket. That's controlled by a potentiometer. So these two whites, I, I, I've used a different kind of cable because this is basically, it is live, but it's very, very low current. It's a one watt circuit. So um, this is basically signal cable. And this potentiometer is a one watt potentiometer. So it does take a little bit, but not very much. And it's linear, so um, use a linear potentiometer means that you get a nice linear adjustment on the power output. In terms of the cable being used, it's it's very this is very critical. You've got to consider the loads you're putting on it. Um, so even though even though we've we've derated this to 25 amps, I've still used four mil square uh, cable, which is way overrated. But that's good. You know, you don't want heat build up in this because you've got very, you haven't really got much of a means of cooling it. Also, for all of the high current circuitry, the cable being used is what's known as tri-rated cable. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly what it's. It's basically three certifications it has, um, but it's it's recommended for use in in panels. So all the high current stuff is that, and I've got a consistent. Um, consistent sort of scheme going on here. So the high current stuff is brown and blue and using tri-rated cable. And then the control is orange and black. So orange being live, black being uh, neutral. And earth stays the same throughout. Signal stuff, I've used white. So that that's basically how the electrics are working on this, and you know this is all stuff. I really recommend these din din rails and din mountable stuff is just great. Um, so that's another advantage of the contactor over a relay. Um, if we just talk about that for a second, so the reason I went with a contactor, generally speaking, your normal electromagnetic relays, um, you know, they come in lots of packages. This is one here. Um, these are good. Um, they're I would use them up to about ten amps. Anything more than that, I like to use something a bit more robust. Now, the main advantages of this, really, as I said, this one happens to be a double throw. Um, you do get that with these relays. In fact, I think this might be one. Um, I like the fact you can mount them on the din rail, and I like the fact they they're, they're more. They're more robust and they, they prevent welding. So when you've got a high current load, there's always the potential for the relay to stick. So the, the, the contactor on the relay can, under a high current load, weld itself closed, which is a problem because then you've potentially got a live circuit you don't want to be live. And if it's, if it's 
loops if it's your main switch you mean so I you don't have another way of breaking it um, so to be clear in this scenario if I can't control if I can't control the power using this switch I can't control the power I mean I can maybe turn this down but that's not a robust solution um, there's no physical way of interrupting the current in this in this circuit aside from me turning this off or going back to the breaker or something like that. So you need a really robust thing because if that sticks on, so if this is basically not responding and it's stuck on, you you know, it's potentially dangerous um, or damaging at the very least. So these these have extra sort of they're spring loaded contactors, so they're they're and they're got a bit more oomph to them. They're designed for this sort of uh, this sort of current. So you can rely on these more to to disconnect themselves when you need them to. Um, so so if we're talking, you know, we're now talking mechanical stuff related to to this. Um, yeah, DIN rails, are great. These boxes are great. Um, the fact that you can remove the plate is really useful. Um, the fact that you have this removable panel is is great as well, both for access and doing your input output. Um, if you're not using a relay like this, you may well want to use this panel. You can take the panel off, drill all your holes for your input output, and then screw it back on. So this could be the bottom. Um, cable management, I haven't gone too much with this. Um, on my bigger panel, I've got all sorts of cable clips and stuff like that controlling it. The fact is, there's not too much going on here. Um, so it doesn't bother me too much. One important thing is to use some sort of protection by the hinge because uh, you can get the potential for damage by frayed cables, by pulling, stuff like that. So having making sure there's enough slack um, so, so you can open and close this without worrying about pulling out connectors or damaging the cable is, is important. The last thing you want is a damaged cable sort of here where it opens and closes and then it's shorting either with each other or with the panel itself. Um, so uh, th this this up here I've done by taking off the original metal plates. Let's stand this up so you can see. I've taken off the original uh, plates. I've used it as a stencil to uh, cut a piece of aluminium and then what I've done is I had this heatsink lying around it's an old Xbox heatsink I think from when I used to repair those and this one obviously didn't make it the relay is bolted through so I've drilled and tapped the heatsink so it's basically this this is this is the nut effectively so it's not actually attached hard to the plate just to this it makes life quite easy and I've used you, you need thermal interface material, especially here, and you need thermal interface material to fill in all the, because it's not a perfect surface, um, you need it to fill in the gap. As I say, especially here, because, you know, it's just a, a bit of aluminium and a bit of aluminium, it's scratched, it's not polished, there's lots of air pockets in there um, between between the two surfaces. I've used just used copper grease. It works really well. Um, it's not quite as good, probably, as your, like, computer um, thermal interface material but for this um, it's more than adequate obviously just be careful it is copper grease it is conductive don't go crazy um, what other mechanical things do we need to talk about I, th I think that's about it to be honest oh, this video's gone long enough 